Hello, welcome to Finn Explains. I'm Finn, and I'll be explaining the formal verification iceberg, or my version of it at least. This is in the context of senior undergraduate students who want to understand different ways of hardening uh, their distributed systems against bugs in general, improper behavior, protocol errors, that sort of thing. Level one, I call fuzzing and property-based testing. Related tools are things like Haskell's Quick Check and its many descendants, or fuzzers, which generate randomized inputs in interesting ways, like American Fuzzy Lock or AFL. To give a basic idea of how all this works, consider this extremely simple piece of more or less pseudocode. Don't try to think of this as a real programming language, it's not. Imagine you have a function called increase, which takes a number and increases it. Here it's implemented at x plus 1, it's just to fit on a slide. Then, you have a rule. You want to be sure that what comes out of this is at least as big, if not bigger than, what went into it. A very simple way to do this is to just take every number from like 0 to 1000 and just try it. Try every case. Try a bunch of cases, try random cases, try cases in different distributions. That is the discipline of fuzzing and property-based testing, roughly speaking. Obviously, there's a lot more to these tools, and there's a variety of fascinating research that goes into them. But for the purpose of this iceberg, I hope this gives you kind of an idea of what the area is, and gives you links to things you can look up if you really want to look into it. This is also the most practically usable thing because, really, it just calls into your actual code that maybe you already wrote. Often, there's different versions for different programming languages. Very convenient. But, as I step down into level 1.5, yes, I made fractional levels, you might begin to wonder, okay, that works on functions, single pure functions, that don't have side effects, that is. But how do I do this on my distributed system? It's huge, it has threads and stuff. And the answer is basically, you mock out the scheduler. There's also a bunch of fascinating research into this deeper methodology for concurrent and distributed programs. Two notable tools are Coyote and Modist. You can go check these out, links in the description, if you want to learn more. For now though, I'm just gonna summarize. So how do we apply this type of methodology of just running through a bunch of combinations to distributed systems. Turns out, mocking, or something like mocking, is pretty ideal. You just replace a bunch of stuff. You replace things like, I don't know, the pthread create library call, any of your asynchronous I.O. functions, network stack. Just replace everything your system sees. Create a complete virtual reality. Well, one that's good enough for testing anyway and then just puppeteer your system. If your I.O. is going to behave a certain way under test, force it to behave a bunch of other ways. See if your system still works. This is still kind of a stochastic method. There's obvious problems when it comes to which combinations do you choose? Which inputs do you choose? How do you combine all of these things to get any kind of reasonable coverage of your code? That is all why this research is very interesting, and why the tools are not just a for loop and a bunch of funny library patches. There's a lot of stuff that goes into this. However, at a high level, this is basically what it is, and I hope that this has some practical use to you, perhaps. Again, these kind of 1.5 levels are the most accessible form of formal verification. Now, moving down to level 2. Model check. The tools that I reference here are actually quite diverse. So I'm talking about Pigo, TLA+, Alloy. Um, Pigo, for example, is kind of an imperative programming language. TLA+, is a bunch of set theory. Alloy is kind of this constraint satisfaction system. The point of this all is that we have departed from traditional code. You're going to express your system some which way, and you're going to basically end up with the core protocol logic with a bunch of pieces missing. That doesn't mean your system is strictly incomplete, but it means that you've probably scoped 
your problem and your reasoning to more so the logical foundations of your application. You will probably not be checking details like packet parsing, like how the TCP stack actually works. You will more so be looking at something like this. Consider, again, this imaginary programming language, or modeling language, where we have a producer and a consumer. Yes, that example that you probably remember from your intro to parallel programming or concurrent programming. The producer sends stuff, the consumer listens and receives stuff. So given these two definitions of producer and consumer, we can see a clear relationship between them. But already, there's quite a lot of things that can happen just because we have two concurrent entities. Now let's just map that out. Just start at the beginning and explore what's possible. This is the core concept of model checking. You have this concept of a state, then you have transitions from state to state, and different states have different properties, and different transitions have different conditions. This can get quite complex. So let's just examine some of the possibilities here. Let's say that we start with no messages in flight, the producer is idle, the consumer is just listening. Let's assume it started. You could model the starting process as different states and transitions, but I chose not to, and you can choose this. The first thing that we can observe. The only thing, in fact, from an empty state is producer sends a message. The consumer can just sit there, but it's not going to receive anything because nothing was sent, right? Then, once we've sent a message, a message is in the ether. Again, we should have some understanding of what that means. Is it floating out of order? Is it sent on a TCP queue that is going to have forced order? That's kind of up to us to determine, and I'm just hand-waving this for the purpose of these graphics. The next step, we actually branch. It is possible that the consumer immediately receives the message, at which point we assume the message will no longer be in flight. Or the producer can send another message, and then at that point you have two messages in flight. Then the consumer might receive one of those two possible messages, and we're back to the previous state again. Or we could consider what if the producer sends three concurrent messages? Being able to consider more or fewer messages is an important parameter here. Understand that if we considered infinite messages, this thing would have infinite size. It would just go down and down and down forever. The point of model checking is not so much to cover everything, but to cover everything up to some point or other, or many things up to some point or other. There's different approaches that vary in their trade-offs. But the point is, you can now use this graph to mechanically assert interesting things. Like, for example, the consumer cannot receive a message that was not sent. Or, if you care about the network behavior, for example, if the network is able to have duplication, let's say we're working with UDP, it is possible that you receive MSG, but that it's still in flight and you receive it again. You would end up with a more complex graph, and then your producer-consumer would have to work harder to maintain the original rules. At which point it becomes very interesting to assert things like the consumer only receives the set of messages that was sent, or something like that. The conditions get more complex, the graph gets more complex, and in practice, these graphs are thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of nodes, insane, incomprehensible transitions, and the key to this is you state rules. Simple sounding but subtle rules, like as I was saying a minute ago, the consumer only receives what the producer sent. The more complex your system, the more powerful it is to reason about that rule. That, I would say, is what you really need to understand from model checking. Again, panning back to our iceberg, the tools that I'm citing are actually quite different in behavior, but Overall, they all somewhat do this thing in some way with some trade-offs. Our initial trade-off, in fact, you'll have noticed, is enumerating the states. That's a huge deal. If I want state 1000, I'm going to have to generate a lot of graph to get there, and if I actually store all of that, I mean a thousand is fine. Modern computing is very powerful. But 10,000? A million? There's kind of a combinatoric explosion, and I'm leading in to symbolic reasoning. Level 3. 
For example, symbolic reasoning tools that I'm aware of are Daphne and Ivy, both of which have been used to build real distributed systems. Instead of enumerating cases, which is powerful and useful, we think about cases in a more logical sense. So this is where we get the chalk and the blackboard out. Well, sort of. If you're doing symbolic reasoning, you no longer have all the data. So you have to work with the idea of the data. And the traditional way to do that is, for example, with our various forms of mathematical induction that we know and love from our theory classes. For instance, prove base case, assume property holds for state Sn, prove the property holds for state Sn plus 1. And with the wonders of our symbolic reasoning tools, we can actually guess most of the proof, but not all of it, especially inductive properties. Actually figuring out what to assume is not really a solved problem. So you're going to have to put on a bit of your thinking cap, get a hot drink, and reason your way through the problem. This is a bit more tricky than you might be used to if you're just doing some of the higher levels, and requires a certain amount of theoretical background to use properly. However, let's look into it a bit, because I think it's still quite understandable. Let's go back to something that looks a bit like our state graph from earlier, but it has some key differences. To help you visualize what it feels like to prove things about these structures, notice that we actually have about the same thing from our original program. The difference is we didn't start at the beginning. We don't know what messages are in flight. We have some number, which is reasonable, right? We aren't looking at a specific state. We've just assumed that there is some state that we're in, and we know nothing about it. From there, you can actually step forward and say, what possible step forwards can we take? Well, maybe the consumer receives a message, but you can't guarantee it. You don't know if there are any messages in flight. Then the producer sends a message. In our next state, then we do have a message in flight, at which point you can then guarantee the consumer is able to, but does not have to, receive at least one message. If you want to move even further along, you can go to our next next state, which if we're following producer sends, now we'll have two concurrently sent messages, which the consumer can then be guaranteed to be able to receive, in principle at least, and so forth. You can go next, 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 or you can go to previous, or whatever it is. You can navigate this structure as an abstract thing and sort of unfold what you do and don't know about it. Using this type of reasoning, you may then build an inductive proof, like you're used to. Some of you may have seen how to do inductive proofs over structures, and that is exactly what this is. For those who didn't, this is what that is. But that's enough of the diagrams and the going into detail for that part. This has been the symbolic reasoning part, and this opens up something of a Pandora's box. Notice that I said that the algorithm can help you guess the proof. In fact, it will try very, very hard to guess the proof. It is an NP-complete problem to do this. That doesn't mean it's impossible. That's actually a common misconception. It just means that any attempt to solve an NP-complete problem will potentially end in infinite computation. Honestly, that's about the same as the problem with model checking. Like, if you forget to correctly stop it in the right place, like you say, oh, just just omit that line where you assume that the producer never sends more than three concurrent messages. You go for coffee and you come back and your computer is melting with a billion states explored. Maybe more like a million. It doesn't explore them that fast. In symbolic reasoning, it's quite possible to also melt your symbolic reasoner just by accidentally giving it some random thing that it gets stuck on. This is a normal thing and the tools have pretty good timeout and interrupt support because... Of course you would need that. But what if I told you that at some cost, conditions may apply, you can avoid this. That's how we go to level 4. And I won't explain this very much because honestly, a lot of the concepts are very much the same. You have common theorem provers. Uh, their names would be things like Coq, C-O-Q for the rooster in French. Uh, you have Agda, you have Idris, not Idris Elba. Uh, I don't think we've been able to make a proof mechanism out of someone's movie career yet, though we have managed to make uh, Magic the Gathering Turing complete. In practice, applying this to distributed systems, we've got Ironfleet, 
diesel, which are each ways of constructing full machine-assisted mathematical proofs of correctness of a system, and then having built that system and actually having it run. Not to go into too much detail, but essentially, interactive proof-based methods are the same as the symbolic methods, except with a lot more content. Every time the system would guess or fill in a bunch of proof steps, you have to basically input these yourself. What I'm trying to say is basically, it's not so much that you need a graduate degree to be able to use this type of system, but using this type of system may be worth a graduate degree. Of course, it's not all towers of little mortarboard caps and multiple cups of coffee. There are also quite a lot of tools to help you. While proof-based methods are very manual, there are quite a lot of uh, techniques and tools that can help you along. For instance, most theorem provers come with very powerful macro systems which allow you to construct proofs very easily. There are also many libraries of pre-built proof steps, some are very sophisticated. So in a way, you've got a lot of help. It's just the fundamental difficulty bar has risen somewhat. And that's basically all I have to say about this type of methodology. I wouldn't encourage this as maybe your first attempt, but do consider that these tools are always getting better. Someone will probably innovate and make them more usable. And... Wait a second, where was I? Um... Oh, right! The other level, the end of the video, right, yes. This whole time, we've been talking about testing systems. We even ended up with complete worked proofs of why these systems are correct. But there is an inconvenient truth that we need to address as well. That is, all of these things are testing mechanisms and do not quite represent the real system. Now there are techniques where you can get logs from the real system, try to approximate what it actually did, and then test whether that is reasonable, but ultimately nothing is quite complete. On the one hand, I've linked a little study of bugs in verified systems. You can find that study in the description, but I have a personal anecdote for this one. That Iron Fleet system up there, I had to evaluate it as part of one of the studies I was doing, and I discovered that if you run the system under enough load, it just sort of keels over. And I was wondering, what? Why? The protocol is formally verified, there's the whole proof, it's machine checked. But after a bit of investigation, I discovered an unfortunate mismatch. So this is a distributed system that has a bunch of different nodes that are synchronized via UDP. And to use UDP effectively, the simple wisdom is if it doesn't work, try again. It can just transiently fail. What they forgot to say is, in practice, UDP packets have an upper size limit. That size limit is some smallish number of bytes, you know, hundreds, maybe a thousand, but it's there, and they forgot to actually specify that. It's understandable, really. Arbitrary size is quite natural in a theorem prover. Fixed size takes more effort. But the problem is, since they verified under the assumption that all failures in UDP will go away if you try again, eventually, maybe, their system was not written to chunk their data into pieces that would actually send properly on a real connection, and so it would try to send bigger and bigger messages. This is somewhat load dependent, so it would work under smaller load with less data. But if you run a heavy benchmark on the system, the synchronization messages get bigger and bigger, and eventually it builds a synchronization message which is too big for UDP to send, and it fails. So it retries, and it fails, so it retries, and it fails, so it retries, and it fails, and it has no logic for having a chunking mechanism or anything like that. Now, not to rag on Iron Fleet too much, that was like the one problem, and obviously, if anyone finds it, you can just go fix it. It's pretty easy to understand once you know what it is, and it's pretty easy to edit the right piece of code, although you might have to rewrite parts of the proof. I don't know, I didn't try it. However, this is an important lesson that your proofs, your verifications, your millions of auto-generated test cases, all your sort of mock-ups of replacing the concurrency and forcing the system to perform unusual tasks, all your model checking, none of it will ever be complete. It will be pretty good. It will likely be useful. Try these tools. 
especially the top ones. Try delving deep if you like, but just do remember, there are limits. There is no silver bullet. You can just do your best and maybe catch some more bugs, and that's fine. This is the actual end of the video. I just want to give a shout out to Pigo, which is the project for which I've been the lead developer. Go check it out. The other projects are cool too. Feel free to reach out if you want to collaborate on anything or if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer those. Otherwise, thank you for listening and have a good day.